I'm, I'm not supposed to go off script, but I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, you'll find I'll do that a lot during the day. I apologize if it means that we end up a little bit late. We'll try to stay on time. Um, the reason I want to go off script is, is I want to talk about something that happened yesterday here in Sault Ste. Marie. The, um, the local immigration partnerships from, uh, from Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, uh, Timmins, North Bay, if I forgot anybody, I'm sorry. Uh, got together yesterday uh, for what they do. They have a regular quarterly meeting. Uh, and because of all of the things that are happening in immigration, they actually, oh, sorry, Thomas. Uh, of course, the, the, the Francophone uh, immigration uh, organization for the entire North. Uh, one person to cover the entire North, Thomas. Like, seriously, come on, get some more staff. Uh, in any event, um, uh, in any event, uh, they got together yesterday to talk about the future of, uh, of immigration, how to coordinate, how to organize. And, and I think it's important to highlight that level of cooperation. I think that we saw FedNor was in the room, IRCC was in the room, uh, ENDM was there. Then I thought I saw you over there. There you are. Uh, and, uh, and also all five of the rural northern pilot uh, communities were there, as was uh, all of the local immigration partnerships, Society Economique d'Ontario. Uh, and they were talking about a conference, or two conferences actually, one in the northeast and one in the northwest, to coordinate that effort. And one of the first things they decided is those conferences, both of them have to start with a conversation with First Nations. Uh, so they're going to spend the first half day of an immigration conference talking with First Nations about how to do it right, how to make sure that it's inclusive and, and collaborative and that the resources that are used to welcome uh, those types of newcomers are also potentially available to help folks who are moving from other communities into larger centers uh, transition. So I think that that's exciting that we're at the point now where we're talking about those kind of conversations in advance and, and leading into it in a, in, a, in a much more inclusive way. I think it will, as, uh, as Chief Sayer suggested, um, prevent hard lessons later on. Uh, on that note, I'm... Uh, now supposed to introduce Dr. Heather Hall, uh, and after Heather speaks, perhaps we'll have an opportunity to hear from the uh, kind sponsors for her talk, uh, which was Algoma University. So thank you very much uh, for the university to step up. Uh, it's actually a, a great opportunity for me because uh, coming to Northern Ontario six years ago, I've heard a lot about Heather and her work, but I've never met her until yesterday. So, uh, so now I get a chance to see her in person. Um, my understanding is she's now the new brand, brand new. Is that, uh, is that the brand new, uh, director of economic development and innovation program at the university of Waterloo. So congratulations on the latest accomplishment. Uh, Dr. Hall is one of the leading scholars on innovation and economic development in rural and Northern regions in Canada. She grew up in Northern Ontario and has a professional personal interest in researching issues that are important to the North. Uh, I'll leave it there other than to say that our founding vice chair is a gentleman by the name of George Macy. Uh, and George, of course, is a huge fan of, uh, of Heather. And I think he must have mentioned you 17 times in the first time we had coffee. And I apologize, but I forgot the note they handed me. Um, for those of you who are active on social media, I'm told I'm supposed to give you this to follow and or tweet and include in your tweets. So we've got this is an awful long list. Can't we just pick one? Anyway, uh, don't forget to follow us at, at Northern Policy. Uh, we've got uh, hashtag State of the North, and it's all written out. We've got hashtag Etat du Nord for the Francophones in the room. We've got hashtag Future North. And of course, the Francophone version of that is hashtag Future Nord. Uh, and I'm sure the Francophones can both pronounce that better than I can and spell it. Uh, on that note, Heather, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Charles, uh, for the warm introduction. It's great to be home in Northern Ontario to discuss the future of our region. I'm excited to catch up with a few familiar faces in the room and listen to what looks like a very exciting day of diverse speakers. I've been asked this morning to provide a bit of an overview of the trends facing Northern regions, including Northern Ontario, and some lessons learned from my work across Canada and internationally. When Charles first told me that the theme of today's event was Future North, I started thinking about my vision for Northern Ontario in 2030. In 2030, all people in Northern Ontario will have access to basic services, including clean drinking water, health care, safe housing, quality K-12 education, as well as broadband and cell phone coverage. Our youth will have job opportunities in traditional and non-traditional industries, they may choose to go away and experience all the world has to offer, but there will always be opportunities back home. Entrepreneurial initiatives will be encouraged and supported, and the wealth generated from our natural resources will be shared directly with the communities impacted by their development. 
we will be the world leaders in balancing resource development and environmental sustainability on innovation and safety in the mining industry and forestry industry and value-added development. Our building designs will be the envy of regions across the north and we will pioneer new infrastructure techniques that are suited to our northern climates. Decisions affecting Northern Ontario will be made in Northern Ontario with Northern Ontario, not for it. Could this happen? Maybe. Think about all the positive changes we have seen over the last two decades in particular, things that seemed impossible 10, 20, 30 years ago. Did we ever think that Sudbury could be green again? I'm from Sudbury, so I can pick on it a little bit. Did we ever think that we would be home to the first medical school to open its doors in Canada in over 30 years? or have a school of architecture? Or what about our growing TV and film industry? I certainly never imagined as a kid growing up in Kirkland Lake in the 80s that my mom in her retirement would start a career as a background extra in a movie starring Eva Longoria and Forrest Whitaker. On a more serious note, the recognition of indigenous rights as well as the conversations and actions towards truth and reconciliation, new relationships being formed and others being strengthened between indigenous and non-indigenous communities, and the decisions over resource development, who benefits and who decides are all signs of how far we've come, but also how much farther we need to go. So changing the future of Northern Ontario will not be easy. If we want to have a future that is fundamentally different, we need a firm understanding of the trends that we are up against. I'd like to spend a few minutes this morning discussing what I think are the four biggest trends that we are facing in Northern regions. Those are demographics, economic restructuring, infrastructure and service def deficits, and governance issues. So starting with demographics, the population of Northern Canada as a whole, and by Northern Canada, I'm referring to our three territories, as well as our provincial Norse, or the Northern regions of BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Labrador. As a whole, we increased slightly uh, from 2011 to 2016, adding roughly 40,000 people across that whole region. But our population is decreasing as a share of the national population. Overall, we're seeing an uneven pattern of growth emerging within northern regions, with some communities experiencing decline, others that are experiencing slower rates of growth, and some that are even seeing rapid growth. For example, we're seeing rapid growth in some indigenous communities, and until a few years ago, communities that were located close to resource development pro projects. In some of our indigenous communities, rapid growth is putting increased pressure on housing, education, and other services, which are already underfunded and under stress. In our resource boom communities, think Fort McMurray a few years back, they were also experiencing pressure related to an influx of workers, often mobile workers, who are placing increased demands on services and infrastructure, often without the resources or capacity to respond. In our slowly growing communities and in our declining communities, we're ex experiencing accelerated population aging with higher numbers of seniors and lower numbers of youth under the age of 15. This introduces a number of challenges from economic development and succession planning for our businesses to the fiscal realities of local governments who struggle to provide services to those who remain without raising taxes. If you're a visual person, this is what our growth trends look like between 2006 and 2016 for our CAs and CMAs, or places with populations that are over 10,000 people. You can see a lot of slow growth and decline in our larger cities here in Northern Ontario. Rapid growth in Northern Alberta, which has since slowed significantly, and decline across other Northern regions across the country. One of the provinces dealing with the issue of population decline head on is Newfoundland and Labrador. In 2018, for the first time in history, more people died in the province than were born. They are seeing some increases in international migration to the province, but also an increase in migration to other provinces. So they actually had a net loss of 3,000 people last year. Last week, Statistics Canada released their population projections for Canada for the next 25 years. And in all the scenarios that they ran, the province will shrink. This issue is especially pronounced in the smaller communities, with the Harris Centre reporting a decline in population of up to 40% in some communities. How is the government responding? Well, one is a population strategy focused on increasing the labour force by encouraging more immigration, modernizing the provincial college system, and focusing on ways to become more productive and innovative. The other is resettlement. 
Newfoundland has a long history with rural resettlement. In this round, residents and small communities are being offered up to $270,000 per household to leave and start again in a larger community. For this to happen, over 90% of residents have to vote in favor of resettling. This has been hugely divisive and emotional, as you can imagine, with many rural residents encouraging the government to reinvent rather than resettle rural communities. And before you think this can't happen to your community, think about whether you still have a bank, a post office, a grocery store, how far your children travel to school, the state of your infrastructure, the availability of health services, your tax base, and whether the provincial government will keep funding our community's survival. Moving on to the second major trend facing our communities, Northern Canada is striving to adapt to the new economy, an economy that is increasingly global, where change can literally happen overnight. What happens on the other side of the world can now have direct and often immediate consequences for Canada and our Northern communities and regions. We've seen some dramatic shifts over the last few decades in our resource sectors, where resource companies have increased con consolidation strategies and pursued more flexible and mobile labor arrangements. We now have entire communities, especially out east in Newfoundland and Labrador and Cape Breton, that are dependent on fly-in, fly-out work at industrial sites across northern Canada. According to a report from the State of Rural Canada, we are now exporting more raw resources that at, than at any time in the past. However, there is less local employment per volume of commodity exported. There's also fewer local benefits from those resource industries, as some companies struggling to, for profitability have argued for reduced contributions to local property taxation and contribute less via other means to community infrastructure. One of the most pressing economic trends facing our northern communities is automation. According to the Brookfield Institute, 46% of work activities in Canada have the potential to be automated. The industries with the highest proportion of work activities at risk include accommodation and food services, transportation, warehousing, manufacturing, mining, oil and gas extraction, agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting. So all sectors that are important to the North and Northern Ontario. Last year, the Federal Deputy Minister's Committee on Inclusive Growth had an internal presentation on the future of work in Canada. They argued that the greatest impacts will be felt in our rural and small towns dependent on high-risk sectors like manufacturing and mining, while the benefits of our technological advancements will go to our largest urban centers. This isn't far off into the future, this is now. I was at a mining conference a few years ago in Sudbury and a major mining company stated that their goal is to have no people underground with a fully autonomous fleet that can be operated from the surface. I'll let you digest that for a minute. This would essentially mean that a mine in Northern Ontario could be operated from anywhere in the world. In Australia, Rio Tinto is developing the mine of the future, which includes autonomous vehicles and remote controlled operations. Conservative estimates on the impacts of automation in the Australian mining sector suggest a 30 to 40% reduction in overall employment, coupled with a significant shift in the type of skills needed in the industry. Other anticipated impacts include population and an economic decline in mining communities and an overall decline in community investment. In Canada, the impacts of increased automation in the mining sector could be significant. The mining sector currently employs over 373,000 people, most of whom work and live across Northern Canada with the highest salaries of all industrial sectors. The mining sector is also the largest private sector employer of indigenous people across the country. A recent report by the Center for Social Responsibility in Mining argued that in Australia and Canada, mine automation could disrupt the indigenous employment gains we have seen in the mining sector over the last decade. Given these economic trends, we need to ask ourselves, is our labor force ready? Do we have the appropriate training programs in place? Can we respond quickly? And are we working with companies to ensure that when, not if, automation occurs, that the jobs that do exist remain local? There are also massive infrastructure deficits that exist across Northern Canada, which probably does not surprise anyone in this room. 
My colleague Tara Vinadre and I did a report for the federal government two years ago on innovation in non-metropolitan areas. And one of our biggest arguments is that it's impossible to talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic development in the 21st century without access to broadband and cell coverage. It's also difficult to talk about economic development when communities, especially some communities in the far north, do not have access to basic needs like clean drinking water, affordable food, education, and safe housing. We also know that across the country, the state of our northern infrastructure is deteriorating and being impacted by climate change in ways that we could never imagine. This lovely photo is of the only road passing through southern Labrador, and it is not a gravel road, it is supposed to be paved, but that was the state of the infrastructure a couple of years ago when we were doing research in that region. The final trend that's impacting northern regions are issues related to governance. My colleague Ken Coates at the University of Saskatchewan calls the provincial north, so the northern regions of all our provinces, the forgotten north. Due to the lack of attention these regions receive from their respective provincial governments and the federal government. He argues that the provincial Norse in Canada are among the most marginalized, externally controlled, and impoverished regions in the country. He also believes that the provinces have come to rely on northern resource wealth to power their provincial economies and sustain provincial government spending and have little interest in sharing that wealth back to the north. In northern Ontario, his arguments probably resonate with many of us in the room. We are very fortunate to have a ministry at the provincial level and a federal organization tasked with economic development. They certainly could use more authority to make decisions and more resources to act. Across the North, we are seeing the devolution of responsibility without the devolution of resources and decision-making authority. Essentially, our communities are being told to do more with less as provincial governments address the challenges of their huge fiscal deficits. There is nothing inevitable about these trends. They are occurring by virtue of what we choose to do or not to do, especially in our policy decision making. So what can we do to encourage a more positive future for Northern Ontario? I've narrowed my list down to four key insights. There are many more that we will hopefully discuss throughout the day, but I offer these as a way to get the conversation started. So my first insight is to be bold, take risks and think outside the box. A few of my favorite examples are Buchanes, Norway, Lulia in Northern Sweden, and Fogo Island in Newfoundland and Labrador. Buchanes is a tiny town of roughly 200 people north of the Arctic Circle. So it's kind of at the confluence of where Norway, Finland, and Russia meet way up in the Arctic. In the 1980s, they experienced a crisis in their cod fishery and their population started to decline. Unhappy with the lack of attention their community was receiving from senior levels of government, a local action committee was formed and they decided to put an ad in the leading newspaper in Oslo with the simple headline, Will Someone Accept Us? And I'm going to read out a bit of that ad, so bear with me. The ad went on to state, is there a place in Norway that will welcome an increase in population of about 300 people? We ask as citizens of the fishing community Buganes in Eastern Finnmark who are now fed up. We feel it is time to put everything behind us and start again somewhere else. We want to avoid becoming burned out and worn out in our struggle for existence for no purpose. We want to use our strength in a community where we can work for a future for ourselves and our children. We want to move together as a group. Solidarity among the people of Buganes is strong. The adult part of the population has a mixed professional background. With our competence and go-ahead spirit, we have much to give. We would be bringing 50 children. We are interested in moving south of Trondelag. Even if there are difficulties in providing jobs, we won't let that scare us. We can help in creating new jobs. So essentially, they put their entire town on the market for giveaway. But their method worked. They received national attention, and after some ups and downs, the community is now a leader in catching and selling live king crab through innovative solutions that bring their product from fishermen to plate. They have a crab hotel, I kid you not, in Oslo, where crabs enjoy an evening before being shipped all over the world. Each crab comes with a QR code, so moving crab fishing into the 21st century. 
which when scanned by the consumer will provide information on size, catch date, a bio of your fisherman, and information about the catch site. So for this QR code that I have up on the slide, our fisherman, as you can see there, is Edgar. And according to his profile and his video, his interests include dancing and singing to ABBA songs. So get your message out there. This was, it started in the 1980s with the ads before social media. We have so many tools for advocacy available. Use them, use humor, be innovative. My second example is Lulia, Sweden, located just under 100 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. It has a population of roughly 77,000 people, so more in line with some of our bigger communities here in the north. Traditional industries include the fish, fisheries, mining, and forestry. In 2013, Facebook opened its first data center or server farm outside of the United States in Lulia. One of the reasons why was how Lulia marketed itself as the node pole and argued that the cold Arctic temperatures would act as a natural coolant, which would require less energy and be more environmentally friendly for these massive server, server farms. Many of them are several football fields in length. And according to Facebook, the server farm in Lulia was the most energy efficient computing facility ever built. Since opening, applications and computer science courses at Lulia University of Technology have increased, while five other companies have established data centers nearby, and they're seeing other spin-off growth and service businesses emerge in the region. So the takeaway from Lulia is to really know your assets and how to market them, get out there and show businesses and government what you have to offer. The third example is Shorefast Foundation on Fogo Island. Fogo Island has a population of roughly 2,200 people. Its economic history is tied to the cod fishery, which collapsed in Newfoundland in 1990s. It's only accessible by ferry, boat, or charter plane or helicopter. After the cod fishery collapsed, the community really suffered. People, especially young people, were moving away, and there was little economic opportunity on the island, plus limited capacity to do anything about it. In 2006, a former resident, Zita Cobb, created the Shorefast Foundation with her brothers. They had grown up on Fogo Island, and she had went away to work and became a quite successful finance executive in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. Wanting to contribute back to the island, she established a scholarship fund to help youth pursue post-secondary education. However, with no college or university campus on Fogo, she was confronted by a mother who accused Cobb of helping to send their children away. And that mom asked her if she could do anything to help bring people home. This led Cobb and her two siblings on a journey to rebuild Fogo Island as an international destination for the arts and tourism, starting with the creation of the Shorefast Foundation. The focal point of the revitalization of Fogo Island Inn is the architecturally unique Fogo Island Inn that you can see in this photo. It's run as a social enterprise with all surpluses going back into the foundation's initiatives that support the community. All of the textiles in the inn from blankets and furniture are all built locally and available for purchase. She's also teamed local textile workers with international designers to produce innovative designs and ideas. From the moment that you walk in the inn, locals are part of the process, bringing people on tours and educating them about the history of the island. So if you can't find a rich person to build a hotel where Gwyneth Paltrow and the likes will stay, use your sense of place and build on the historic strengths that your community has. One of my favorite parts about the Shorefast story is how it's revitalizing traditional industries like textiles and crafts, boat building and hand lining for cod. These were all industries that had died off as people moved away that are now coming back and making a resurgence. All of these examples from Buganas, Lulia, Fogo have done the unexpected. When people first came up with their ideas, people in their communities didn't think that that would ever work there. But they proved them wrong and are having great success in revitalizing their local economies through these bold initiatives. My second lesson is that we need to act regionally. Given the current fiscal, demographic, economic, environmental, and political realities that we face, 
When I was doing research here in Northern Ontario a few years ago, I asked one of the mayors why they had created NOLUM, which was the Northern Ontario Large Urban Mayors Coalition from a few years back. And his response really resonated with me. He said, if you took a pencil in your hand and you snapped it, it's easy. But if you put five pencils in your hand, you can't break that. It's a great visual for the strength in numbers argument, and it has really worked for us in the past. And it was great to hear uh, comments already being made this morning about how we do need to work together. In Northern Ontario, we need to act regionally at the level of the provincial north. So our organizations like FANOM should be reaching out to our neighbors in Northern Quebec, Northern Manitoba, Northern Saskatchewan, Northern Alberta, Northern BC and Labrador to share lessons and advocate the issues that are important to the provincial north at the federal level. We need to have a common voice at the regional level in Northern Ontario. I've had provincial ministers tell me that it's extremely easy to ignore all of you when you each come with your own shopping lists that your community wants, but it's much harder to ignore you when you all come with the same small list of priorities. We also need to start thinking about smaller regional units within Northern Ontario, whether we call them districts or corridors or economic zones to effectively plan and deliver services. And I know the Policy Institute has put out a few reports on this topic. There are a variety of inf informal and formal ways that we can act regionally. Across the country, we have many formal mechanisms in place like regional districts in British Columbia which were created in the 1960s out of a need for greater regional cooperation and cost sharing between municipalities there and unincorporated areas. These regional districts are governed by a board of director, often composed of a director elected from each unincorporated area and one or more directors appointed from the elected councils of each municip municipality and from a treaty first nation. They have three basic ro roles. They provide region-wide services, such as 911 or regional parks. They provide intermunicipal or sub-regional services, and they act as the general local government for the unincorporated areas. In addition, they can create regional growth strategies to provide a regional lens to development. Another example for economic development is the now defunct regional economic development boards in Newfoundland and Labrador, which provided coordinated economic development support and planning in 20 economic zones across the province. The structure of the Red Bees included a volunteer board of directors made up of representatives from municipalities, businesses, community development, education, labor, and other organizations according to the needs of that particular zone. The day-to-day -day operations were managed by a variety of uh, part-time or full-time staff, and the Red Bees were involved with a wide variety of regional development and community capacity building initiatives. They also created strategic economic plans for their regions to help guide investment. There are many other examples from regional service delivery range agreements and regional accords on tourism to friendship agreements between indigenous communities and neighboring municipalities. The key is to find a way to work together. We are too small and the challenges are too big to do it alone. The third lesson is that we need to reimagine resource development in Northern Ontario. First, we need to move away from the rip it out and ship it out approach to resource development. We need to encourage value added development and I know this is something we have been advocating for a very long time across Northern Ontario. It is starting to get the interests of some of our researchers from across the country as well and Richard Hawkins who's a leading economist at the University of Calgary wrote a report looking at innovation from a uniquely Canadian perspective. And basically what he was trying to do was find reasons why Canada often does so terribly on a lot of our innovation indicators. And his argument is, is that when we export our raw or low value added resources, we're also exporting most of the opportunities to innovate, sustainable high value employment, and most of the spin-off opportunities with it. We also need to find ways to reinvest our resource royalties in a transparent way back into the communities and regions where they are extracted. We are making some improvements here through agreements between governments, companies, and indigenous communities, but there is certainly room for improvement. One example in BC is the Fair Share Agreement, which is now called the Peace River Agreement in the Peace River Regional District in Northern British Columbia. 
The original fair share agreement was signed in 1994 to address the fiscal imbalance between municipalities and the growing oil and gas sector. Municipalities were dealing with increased pressures on infrastructure and services, but most of the industrial activity was actually happening beyond their boundaries, which meant they had no ability to get any of those additional costs paid for through industrial taxes. So the fair share agreement was put in place to provide financial resources to even out that imbalance. The new Peace River Agreement, which was negotiated in 2015, has a similar focus, and it provides $1.1 billion over 20 years for planning programs and infrastructure investments. Imagine if we had access to $1.1 billion in some of our regions here in Northern Ontario and the amazing things we could do. Another example is the royalties for, resource, for regions in Western Australia. With that program, up to 25% of the state's revenue from mining and onshore petroleum royalties are being returned to non-metropolitan regions for additional investment in projects, infrastructure, and community services. So again, taking the resource royalties and wealth that are being extracted from communities in Western Australia and providing that back into the communities to support their initiatives. My fourth lesson is that we need to do a much better job of fostering a culture of innovation. When someone comes up with a new idea or approach in your community or in our region, do we say that's a great idea or do we say or think that will never work here? How can we foster a culture of innovation? I am an unapologetic regional planner, so I always start with a strategy. A few years ago, I led a project in Newfoundland and Labrador exploring how we could advance innovation across that province. And one of our recommendations was to implement smart specialization strategies, which are being used in the European Union as a condition to receive funding from their European Structural Investment Fund. What this does is tie regional development funding to having a smart specialization strategy. So it would be equivalent to communities or regions across Northern Ontario requiring a strategy to access NOHFC or FedNOR funding. The goals of a smart specialization strategy are to build on the unique assets and potential for excellence in a region, engage stakeholders and encourage innovation and experimentation, they're evidence-based with sound monitoring and evaluation systems. They take a broad view of innovation. It's not just product invention or the high-tech sector. It can be social innovation, innovation in tourism. And finally, they focus policy support and investment on key regional priorities that have been identified by those regions. The smart specialization approach includes the six steps that you see up on the screen. The first is the analysis of the regional context and potential for innovation. Second is in creating an inclusive governance structure to ensure participation and ownership. The third is creating a shared vision for the future of the region. Fourth is identifying a small number of priorities for regional development. Fifth is defining appropriate policies, a roadmap, and an effective action plan. And sixth, where we often fall short here in Canada with a lot of our plans is integrating the monitoring and evaluation within that. In late 2017, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador announced that they would be the first jurisdiction in North America to pilot this approach in five regions across the province. This includes Southern Labrador and the Great Northern Peninsula who are focusing on fisheries and tourism, Cornerbrook and the surrounding area where they're focusing on forestry and agriculture, Gander and the surrounding area related to aerospace and defense, the Buren, Buren Peninsula related to industrial technology development, this is where a lot of the offshore oil platforms are being built, and the Avalon region related to ocean technology, so in and around St. John's. The goal in each pilot region is to identify three or four attainable initiatives that enhance connectivity, identify opportunities for the adaption or adoption of new technologies, foster global connections or opportunities, and encourage further collaboration between the key stakeholders in the innovation system. Other ways we can foster a culture of innovation include entrepreneurship training opportunities like Entrepreneur, a six-month training program to empower Indigenous and community-based entrepreneurs to build sustainable businesses and livelihoods across Northern Canada and our three territories, 
Pitch competitions are all the rage. I'm at the University of Waterloo, and it seems that every week there's a pitch competition by one of our incubators in the community. Our incubators could potentially collaborate on a problem pitch competition. So picking a particular theme or a northern issue and getting our best and brightest to think of ideas on how to solve that. One example of this is the Arctic Inspiration Prize, where up to $3 million is awarded annually, and it's focused on addressing the cause of an Arctic issue as opposed to the symptoms. Our northern research centers and post-secondary institutions also have essential roles to play in supporting innovation. We do have some examples across uh, northern Ontario, and I think Peter will probably speak to some of the work that they're doing at the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Center uh, this afternoon. But other examples include at Yukon College, the Cold Climate Innovation Research Center, where they're helping uh, create and commercialize and export sustainable cold climate technologies to subarctic regions. So really recognizing that their asset and their location in the subarctic could provide some viable business opportunities. The center provides funding, business mentoring, and planning assistance with prototype development, project management, marketing support, and patent advice. Projects supported by the center have focused on alternative energy, building construction in a northern context, food security, and environmental remediation, among others. So all issues that are also particularly re relevant to Northern Ontario. Another example of where um, different stakeholders have come together to try and solve a particular problem is Smart Ice, which was created between researchers at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador, communities along the Northern Labrador coast, and now expanding into Nunavut, Government helped provide some of the initial funding as well as industry. And the idea behind Smart Ice is to integrate adapted technology, remote sensing, and Inuit traditional knowledge to promote safe travel for all stakeholders in northern coastal environments. So as sea ice is becoming more unpredictable, they're hoping that this tool can help people travel on those much needed routes. Quite simply, we need innovation, innovative solutions to our pressing challenges, and ideally, they would be developed in the North and by the North. I'd like to end my talk this morning by reminding everyone that Northern Ontario matters. Northern Ontario is home to over 780,000 people and represents almost 90% of the provincial landmass. Northern Ontario has, is, and will continue to be vital to our provincial economy. Our resource industries generate significant economic activity and wealth and provide both direct and indirect employment opportunities across the province. Northern Ontario is also essential to our environmental well-being and of increasing importance in our fight against climate change. And perhaps more importantly, Northern Ontario is home for many Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We may not agree on my vision for the future of Northern Ontario that I alluded to at the beginning, but hopefully we can all agree that what we need in the future in the North is a future for our children. Thank you. Last night over dinner, the board and I were talking about um, <clears throat> whether we wanted to be, what was the phrase? Uh, 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 whether it was better to be an attic or a basement. So again, talking about uh, Northern separation and whether we should be our own province, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you have any thoughts in that direction? Should we just uh, separate ourselves from Ontario and leave those Southerners to their troubles? Certainly, we've seen those arguments over the years. Ideally, I think it would be nice if we could work within the system that we have. Um, I think given that we've been talking about separation for decades and no one seemed to listen to us, I'm not sure uh, those conversations go anywhere down at Queen's Park. So I think the way to do it is just to advocate for more decision-making authority at the regional level. Um, I know there's been some discussion papers that your institute has put out looking at varieties of ways, whether that's something similar to the City of Toronto Act, which gives us more decision-making powers, but also more different ways to raise revenues. I think that's why we also need to have those important conversations about resource wealth and how we can have some of that resource royalty money back in the region to fund some of the things that we would like to do. So I'd like to see us 
try to work within the system that we have and move it forward as opposed to having the conversations about separating entirely because I think those oftentimes land on deaf ears down at Queen's Park, although great, sometimes a great way to get them to look north um, hasn't really amounted to anything over the last few years. Hi, thank you. Uh, follow up on, on Charles. I'm Dave Canfield on, on the board now, a um, retired municipal politician for many years and uh, the other uh, municipal organization president of that for quite a few years, NOMA, the Northwest Ontario Municipal Association, which is two thirds of the landmass of Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, to follow up, I might not totally agree with your answer because we have pushed, and I have pushed since the 90s, since the Lands for Life process, for um, some type of identity for Northern Ontario. The previous government had a, a regional economic development thing going around for a while, brought in people from around the world and with different uh, regional scenarios of how they work things. And they dropped that right in the middle. It just fell right off the face of the earth. Uh, from NOMA perspective, we tried to keep it going. And every time we try and make a decision, uh, Queen's Park falls off. And here's the problem. We were in Windsor a couple of years ago, I can't remember if it was an AMO conference or whatever, and I was speaking there, and I always like to give a geography lesson of where I'm from, because I'm from Kenora, I was Mayor Kenora for 20 years. And the fact of the matter is, from Windsor to Kenora, and as I said, if I got in my car in Kenora, and I drove west, the same distance as it is to Windsor, I would be just outside Vancouver, BC, four legislative buildings, four planning acts, mm -hmm. unless somebody listens. The future of Ontario is in northern and rural Ontario. It will never happen under the system we have now when you have a province that encompasses four planning acts and has one, and the planning act is built around the Golden Horseshoe, basically the corridor from Windsor to Ottawa. It will never, ever, ever work. And I have listened to, I've been, Started municipal government in 1991. <laughs> I've been with all three parties, listened to all three parties. Every party has said the same thing. One size does not fit all. We're just about at 2020. Nobody has changed it. And if I can take one second, I'm going to give you a scenario. We went to the government because Kenora has a bypass around it. There is no services on the bypass. We wanted a sign put up saying there's no services, you have to go into Kenora. People go by, turn around, they're pretty pissed off, to put it in plain English, because they can't get gas, they have to turn around and, and double back. So they agreed. I was down here, I'm also on the advisory team for FP Innovations. We were in Mattawa at the end of April, and uh, they, they, a couple of their forces asked if I wanted to go with them up to White River. So that's what, a thousand, no, a thousand kilometers? In that, in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. I noticed these signs outside of the communities. Limited services with a little gas handle. And guess what? They were outside of every community, including Kenora now. There is no services. One size still fits all. This is how stupid our bureaucrats are. One size does not fit all. And in a, and in a province this size, if it continues, there is no future for Northern Ontario. Unless they get their head out of the sand, and Southern Ontario almost said something else, <laughs> and, and, and change it. And honest to God, I'm frustrated because I spent a lot of years trying to change it. It's not changing. And I don't disagree with you. Um, I think going back to Charles's question, separation might not be the answer, but if we could have default decision-making power, Things like they tried and are still in existence in, in across England with the devolution to the Welsh Parliament, creating systems in place that recognize regional uh, differences and provide the decision-making authority that can be made regionally. So not unlike what we had with our territorial governments and having now the devolved responsibility from the federal government to manage their own resources and keep that resource wealth, Things like that could potentially be a game changer in Northern Ontario if we could have some kind of devolved authority and decision-making power here, whether it's a city of or a region of Northern Ontario Act that provides those legislative powers or some kind of elected assembly 
of our leaders in Northern Ontario that provide more advocacy and have more decision-making power here in the North is definitely something I 100% agree with that's needed. And that's how we're going to change the future, not by keeping with the status quo, but trying to change what we already have and show that there's opportunities to not entirely separate from Ontario, but to say, listen, you've already given powers to the city of Toronto, so this isn't something outside of our wheelhouse. We could think about how can we devolve decision-making authority to Northern Ontario. So some of you, if that's something that's passionate, work with your research centers, work with people like myself who are passionate about the North to come up with a document that could outline that and what that could look like, and then, get it into the hands of the people at Queen's Park that need to hear it and keep driving home that message as a collective. Uh, my name is Jean-Pierre. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, the lack of, I guess, monitoring and evaluation, because that was one of the things in your slide. But you can get into it and <laughs> reasons for it and if you could elaborate on that. Sure. But also, just... In, I'm wondering if there's a, a link at the front end when it comes to the strategies in terms of the quality of the strategies that are that are leading into projects and things. Um, is, is there a lack of evaluation and monitoring? Because there's maybe not as much seriousness given to the quality of some, some strategies that might be put forward in, 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 at various levels. Sure. So I think oftentimes, uh, especially looking at some of our strategies in Northern Ontario, there's a lot of time that goes between some of our larger uh, strategy documents like the growth plan and its predecessors. And so when we do get started on them, there are just so many topics that everyone wants to discuss and have included. And so sometimes that starts weighing down where they can go. And so keeping one of the things with smart specialization is keeping really focused on identifying a few key priorities at first. And then with that monitoring and evaluation uh, part of it, once you're successful, hopefully, in achieving those few first priorities, you move on to the next one. Where we often go wrong is not even including, at least um, publicly or in a transparent way, the implementation pieces. So the financial aspects of how things are going to get funded who's going to be involved, and that's not just up to our provincial and federal government, that's up to other stakeholders in the region to be a part of it and to really own pieces of it and to help roll those uh, priorities out. And it also includes timelines. So when do we hope to achieve these? So the three key pieces are the when, the how, and the who. And so that's really what we're seeing with the smart specialization strategies is they're built into the discussions from day one. If our goal is to create, I'm just gonna pull an example from some of the smart specialization in the European Union, an incubator in our region, because that's what we feel. Here's how much money is going to be dedicated to that. Here are the actors who are going to be in charge of getting it going and up and running. And here's our time frame. So oftentimes we don't see that in a lot of our strategies here in Canada, um, at least in a, in a public way. And certainly, you know, if we look at the growth plan website, I don't think there's been an update in several years. And it's really hard to say um, on, the, on the surface what's going on. I'm sure behind the scenes in our provincial ministry, folks could tell us some of the things and the initiatives that are going on. But the key is to really have that out out front, showing people we're doing things, ticking things off the box, and showing that we're moving forward is really important. Hi. Hi. Um, you gave a lot of, uh, or a number of examples around projects, initiatives, communities that have done uh, very innovative and interesting things. I'm wondering if you could speak to whether diversity in all its forms, whether it's gender or cultural background or language, et cetera, uh, influenced the ability of the group of people or the community to be able to engage in the innovative ideas or be able to be successful in what they've done? Sure. I think that in all the cases, they try to, especially in Fogo, and I would say Buganes, it was a, the entire community. And so everybody who was a part of that community was involved. And so for that, people have a real sense of ownership. 
and want to move forward. Lulio was a bit different because I think it was more your traditional business attraction retention. So a lot of that was done in the ec dev world, but also with some of the, with the Lulia um, University there. So the education and training side. I think that in Fogo especially, um, and to a certain extent in Bougainess, they're now looking at it by how do we bring in other views and other people to help us. And so on Fogo in particular, they've really reached out to international, uh, especially on the textile side, designers to work with communities there from all over the world. And so it's really connecting. We have this kind of, uh, catch term in, in innovation, local buzz, global pipelines. So having that community buzz locally, people in, people buying in, ownership of an idea, but connecting to outside as well and bringing in new ideas, keeping things fresh, so extremely important. And I think that's something extremely important in the North is that we do have a wide diversity of people who call this region home. So making sure that everybody has a chance to be included. And from time to time, people may say, you know, we step back from this process, but always leave the door open for them to come back. Thank you very much.